And I'm going to be introducing Dr. Joseph Finns from Cornell University. Dr. Finns is the E. William Davis Jr. Uh, physician, MD, Professor of Medical Ethics, Chief of the Division of Medical Ethics, Professor of Public Health and of Medicine and Psychiatry at Walt Cornell Medical College. That doesn't fit on one line. He serves as New York Presbyterian Walt Cornell Medical Center's attending physician and director of medical ethics, as well as the Rockefeller University Hospital senior attending physician. After graduating from Cornell Medical College, he completed residency and fellowship training in internal medicine at the New York Hospital Cornell Medical Center. He has pioneered the field of neuroethics, and his research interests include palliative care, issues in ethics and policy in brain injury, disorders of consciousness, and research ethics in neurology and psychiatry. Among other positions and honors, he is currently pre president of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities, laureate award recipient and former government governor of the American College of Physicians, and a member of the Hastings Center Board of Trustees, where he chairs the Fellows Council and has served in a, as an associate for medicine. Wow, that was back in the 80s and 90s? Yeah. Yeah. In the day. Anyway, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Finns in his uh, talk today. He's going to be severe brain injury and organ donation, a call for temperance. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's so good to see uh, so many friends in the front row here. And uh, especially good to see Dan Solmazy from uh, New York, and uh, your your gain was our was our loss, and we still we still miss him in in so many venues that that we shared together, um, and uh, and and uh, I'm really I'm really delighted to be here, um, and and I and I know I heard that Mark was unable to be here, but I just want to extend my congratulations to to him and to all of you for this uh, 30th annual 37th annual faculty uh, series uh, which is kind of an amazing um, institution and 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 I and I call this slide afterthoughts because I'm kind of coming after your whole year and um, uh, discussion and I and I, I mark was in New York um, earlier in last year and you know, when he said, you got to come and do this thing and talk about this, and I said, well, I don't really know anything about organ transplantation. You know, I'm just kind of interested in brain injury and disorders of consciousness, and I've had some, some issues with transplantation. And he said, no, no, that would be perfect. That would be perfect. That, you know, so uh, I kind of feel like, like Daniel in the lion's den here a little bit, but I hope and I look at Dan here for the, the, the biblical reference to make sure I get it right, <laughs> that I get out of the pit okay and nobody kills me, and I'm like Daniel, unscathed because I was praying to the proper God. Um, so in the spirit of open discourse and an idea of just kind of challenging uh, some of your thoughts about transplantation, I'm going to try to talk about, and Lenny and I were talking about this beforehand, this kind of complex web that brings in organ donation, brain injury, brain death, the right to die, and see how we've kind of gotten ourselves into a bit of a mess as the science has evolved. And if, if I leave you with anything, I, I'd like to leave you with a prudential sense of ethics, so, you know, that maybe your enthusiasm should be tempered just a little bit, our practices should be reflected upon a little bit, and evolving knowledge should inform what we do every day. And it would be impossible to come to Chicago and to the McLean Center and, and have a talk uh, that didn't have implications for clinical care and clinical ethics. Um, so I'm going to dive right, right into it. So I'm going to bring this back to 1968, which is a time you probably have all talked about, and, and some of the confluences. Um, you know, in, in, in 1968, we, were, we had the first uh, heart transplant down in South Africa uh, by Christian Bernard and the ad hoc committee at Harvard established um, <clears throat> the brain death criteria, which had an instrumental purpose uh, to allow for the retrieval of organs from people who were brain dead, and that was defined as uh, irreversible cessation of whole brain function, that is both the brain stem and the higher cortical uh, functions. And this problem category was necessitated, necessitated, I should say, by the survival of people who otherwise would have died before there was ventilatory support. Um, in patients uh, uh, who uh, did not have an intact brainstem. If you didn't have an intact brainstem, you wouldn't have autom autonomic drive to breathe, and, um, and you just die, a conventional cardiopulmonary death. But with ventilators, people like that could survive or survive in quotes. And this, um, this report was written uh, by the famed bioethicist and anesthesiologist uh, uh, Henry K. Beecher, uh, at Harvard, who 
for whom the highest prize of the Hastings Center is named, the Beecher Award. And, and his, the basic framework was not to have good organs go to waste. And here's what Dr. Beecher wrote uh, in, a, in, a, um, in, an, in an article in the New England Journal at the same time in 1968, in which he is very utilitarian. About, about the meaning of lost consciousness. If your consciousness is lost, you know, in a sense, you're dead. Uh, you're dead to the point where uh, your life has lost its meaning and we should be able to uh, uh, retrieve uh, organs from what he called the hopelessly, uh, pers the person with a hopelessly damaged brain. And it was viewed as a trade-off. We either squander organs for life without consciousness uh, or give them to some worthy soul who needs a transplant and not to retrieve organs would have a, as he wrote, desperately radical result. The curable, the salvageable, can thus be sacrificed okay, to the hopelessly damaged and unconscious who consume the time and space and money better devoted to those who could be helped. To pretend that no such alternative exists is nonsense. What one gets, the other is deprived of. Notwithstanding, he ended a sentence with a preposition. You know, the thought here is the editors in the room are going, tch, tch, tch. you know, we wouldn't accept that. Um, the, the thought here, you know, is that it's a zero-sum game. And by keeping these people alive, we're letting these good organs go to, go to waste. And what's interesting here is the emphasis on consciousness as that which really makes life life, makes for personhood and all these other things. And, when, and, and it's such an important construct that when you lose consciousness, okay, when that is lost, the traditional physician primary fiduciary obligation to the patient is so attenuated that we turn a patient into a donor, into an instrumental object for the retrieval of an organ. Um, and and uh, yet, it gets more complicated because there's another category where you can lose consciousness and we don't think of them as donors. Um, but we also, we have a state that has also been historically devalued and that's the vegetative state. And the vegetative state is a state in which the brainstem is intact, but there's no higher cortical function. That's the simple definition. We'll come back to that as science evolved. So the other challenge um, is how consciousness and the vegetative state and the right to die all kind of came together in a confluence that has led to certain practices and certain biases. Uh, namely, the using of people with severe brain injury as sources for uh, organ harvest. So we all know this part of the story, more or less, I guess. But bioethics since the 60s has really been predicated on evolution of a notion of self-determination and, and autonomy. And it really evolved as a negative right to be left alone. And in the Quinlan case, that's Karen Ann Quinlan, the right to die. And the right to die in that case is a woman who had a probably a drug overdose at a party in New Jersey um, and was left in the vegetative state. And the judge, Judge Hughes, legitimated that decision, uh, uh, the withdrawal of care, because it was the ultimate in medical futility. Nothing would get better. And, and he noted in his report, in his opinion, the loss of her cognitive sapient state. Now, he asked Fred Plum uh, to uh, examine Karen and Quinlan uh, as the court-appointed uh, neurologist. Dr. Plum was, Dan and I had him as teachers at Cornell, and Dr. Plum, along with, with uh, Brian Jeanette, who was a neurosurgeon from, from Glasgow, Scotland, who was originator of the Glasgow Coma and Glasgow Outcome Scales, wrote a paper in 1972 in The Lancet about the vegetative state, or a syndrome without a name. And they described the vegetative state as a state of wakeful unresponsiveness. That's a parsimonious in a Pellegrino sense, this is a double joke here, a Pellegrino sense of, of just economy of phrase, right? Wakeful unresponsiveness. Eyes are open, but you're not aware of yourself, your others, or your environment. So it's the arousal of the brainstem without the higher cortical function, okay? And Dr. Plum was asked um, by Judge Hughes to testify, and here's a picture of Doc Thing because she was in the vegetative state. And if you read the, the uh, decision, it almost looks at the vegetative state as if it was a terminal state, like a cancer patient in pain dying of a, of a terminal condition. Um, 
But he does make that distinction and point to the importance of loss of the cognitive or sapient state. Now, everybody thinks that Judge Hughes then allowed for her, her ventilator to be removed. And what do you think happened with Karen Ann Quinlan? She breathed, right, because her brain stem was intact. And, and suppose she hadn't breathed because she didn't have a trigger for respiration, she'd probably then be, have had a consistent apnea test to be brain dead. And Dr. Plum once told me, he said, Joe, I knew that she would breathe when they took her off the ventilator. And I said, you know, Dr. Plum was shorter than I, but I looked up to him and I said, Dr. Plum, how did you know? He said, I took her off the, the, the ventilator as part of my neuro exam. And, and huh? And believe yeah, and, and, and he did that to make the distinction between the vegetative state and, and, and brain death. Uh, so the, I think the statute of limitations are over, but I think as a professional, we're talking about professionalism last year, he was asked by the court to do his exam, and the only way for him to definitively know that she wasn't vegetative versus brain dead, or that she wasn't brain dead versus vegetative, was to do the, to do the apnea test. Now, in the ensuing years since the Quinlan case, which is 1976, you know, we've gotten very comfortable with the right to die. Um, and, and, you know, the vegetative state became the ultimate in medical futility. Nothing can or should be done. Um, injuries are immutable. And I think we all kind of, those of us who kind of grew up during this, this, in the immediate aftermath of this era, saw the vegetative brain as a kind of gelatinous gel. You all remember the, you know, those of us who read the autopsy report about Karen Ann Quinlan, she had hydrocephalus ex vacuo. You know, her ventricles were expanded, the cortex had thinned, the weight was, it was half of the normal 1,300 grams. Um, and, and that's our sort of image of the, of, the, of the vegetative state. And I recount some of this history in this book on, on palliative care that I wrote a few years ago. Um, and, and this notion of the vegetative state as is, is, is just this ultimate medical futility held in Cruzan and it, and it even held in Shivo with other pressures. But there's also been a kind of on the quiet side, this is really my focus, uh, a neglect syndrome for another population that's sort of been out of our gaze. And how many of you guys know what I mean when I say neglect syndrome? If you have a parietal lobe lesion, you just don't see half of your visual field, but you don't know that you don't see them. So there's this population out there that exists that has always existed, but we didn't know they were there until it was pointed out to us and we moved our head and we overcame our field cut. And our field cut was for the advent, and I apologize that word here may have other meetings for your conference next week, um, uh, of the minimally conscious state, okay? And this is a state that to the untrained eye is indistinguishable from the vegetative state, but these people are conscious. They have intention, attention, they have memory, they'll, they'll grasp for a, for a ball, they'll say the occasional word, but they do these behaviors episodically. So if I asked, if I was a family member and I saw my loved one doing this and I asked Dr. Sulmazy to come back and verify that what I saw was real, Dr. Sulmazy would come, the patient would not repeat it. That also too is the biology of the, of the minimally conscious state. And Don, Dan would probably, you know, even with the, as well-intentioned and good guy as he is, he'd say the family's having a hard time coming to grips with the fact that, that the situation here is really futile. But the minimally conscious person is episodic. It's kind of like a flickering light bulb. The fact that it can flicker means that some circuit is intact versus a light bulb that just is totally not working, but it doesn't flicker on command. So what has happened and over the years is we have begun in the, you know, the legacy of Fred Plum, uh, begun to work with this population and try to understand who and where they are. And, and, um, and, and in that process, I've come to the sense that we need a more prudential ethic um, that certainly has to make, be aware of this interplay between um, uh, severe brain injury, the right to die, uh, and, and organ transplantation, and be a little more cautious about who our candidates are and, and how we make the dis these decisions. Because from my experience, um, sometimes it's a little too expeditious, and I think we need a more prudential ethic. So I'm going to argue uh, for that in the affirmative. The basis of my work um, is an IRB-approved study um, that, um, uh, of some 40 families that have come to Cornell and Rockefeller for a multimodal assessment of patients of their loved ones with disorders of consciousness. 
They typically come for three or four days. They get an fMRI, they get EEG, they get a PET scan. Um, and these are people who are in the vegetative or minimally conscious state, and we're trying to figure out mechanisms of recovery. We have a room at Rockefeller, you know, a control room at Rockefeller, where we monitor all their, all their movement and their EEGs, or continuous EEGs. And, 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 um, and in addition to my role with that, I also have done interviews with some 40 families learning about their experiences in the healthcare system, and we have some 3,000 pages of transcripts, and, and um, I wrote a book, which I hope will come out at the end of this year, uh, called Rights Come to Mind, Brain Injury Ethics and the Struggle for Consciousness uh, from Cambridge, and, and, and that summarizes my, my, my findings. And, and I have HIPAA coverage, so I can use their names freely, and, and, and some of the characters in the book are Terry and Angelie Wallace, I'll, I'll tell you about him in a minute, and Maggie uh, Worthen, who was a senior at Smith College when she had a brainstem stroke that bled up into her thalamus and her mother Nancy. Um, and I tell basically Maggie and Nancy's story uh, and intersperse the other 40 families to fill it out. And, and, and to a person uh, and to a family, irrespective of a race or ethnicity, rich or poor, or black or white, Hispanic, people encounter a um, disinterested healthcare system a kind of stereotypic trajectory of, of nihilism and neglect, um, a really static view of brain injury. Once you're severely injured, you're not going to get better. Not the dynamic brain that we've come to understand uh, and with, through the scientific knowledge. And, and for our purposes, um, this prompts what I think are premature decisions to withhold or withdraw care and to donate organs. And you know, Dan and I were both you know, PDIA uh, faculty scholars uh, you know, I think, you know, I'm a, I have palliative care, you know, uh, credibility, um, and, and I think we've gotten a little too ideological about it. We need to be more cautious about it, certainly as it relates to people with uh, severe brain injury. Uh, sometimes they get premature palliative care recommendations, um, and, uh, and they're often discharged while medically unstable. So what I'd like to do now is kind of take you through some of this trajectory and, and hope to sort of flesh some of this out with some, some primary evidence. So Lee Woodruff, who was the, the wife of Bob Woodruff, the ABC News correspondent, wrote a book about her husband's brain injury, which was a blast injury and a, and a shearing injury of his calvarium uh, from an IED in Iraq. And she talks about, in, in an instant, everything changes, this immersion in new language and new nosology. You know, we know what, you have a gallbladder, it's infected, you have cancer, we understand that. But you say to somebody, your, your husband's in a vegetative state, or your husband's in a coma, or your husband's brain dead. People have no idea what you're talking about. And, and one of my uh, uh, interlocutors was a man who uh, is a bond trader in Boston, a smart guy. And, and he said, look, let's face it, this is a complicated area. I know a lot about the bond market, but I don't know much about the brain. I mean, he's overwhelmed by the phrases and, the, and this, this brand new um, uh, bit of information. And I think the point, first point is that this imposes an ethical obligation upon us to know what we're talking about and to use our power wisely and make sure people understand what, we're, what, what, the, what the sequences are and what the, the, um, the diagnoses are because they're very vulnerable to this knowledge deficit. And, and we also have to think, and I'll say a little bit later, when we ask them for organ donations, we have to be aware of the shock and trauma that they've just undergone because they may be exceedingly vulnerable at, at, at moments of that. And yet, this is what we get in the literature uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Vidjix, who runs the IC, neuro ICU up at, at the Mayo Clinic in a paper called The Family Conference, End-of-Life Guidelines that Work for Comatose Patients. Now, coma, we'll define just quickly, is an eyes-closed state of unresponsiveness. The eyes open, you're vegetative, okay? Eyes-closed state of unresponsiveness, and it's a self-limited state of a week or two. So these are recommendations that Dr. Vidjix confidently shares in the official journal of the American Academy of Neurology. The attending physician of a patient with devastating injury needs to come to terms with the futility of care. Families who are unconvinced should be explicitly told they should have diminished expectations um, and that withdrawal of care or, or uh, life support or abstaining from performing complex interventions is more commensurate with the neurologic status. A very categorical statement. And here's something that, that, that came up in an interview that, that I had, and it's not the only one, but it's the one that is perhaps the most graphic. 
This is a man who was hit as a pedestrian en route to going to basic training uh, to become a Marine in Philadelphia. He was going to go to Iraq. And the mother says, and I actually had a neurologist tell me, your son is basically just an organ donor now. And I said, when did that happen? Within the first 72 hours, she said. And he said, well, he doesn't have the reflexes of a frog. I responded, as you might, in disbelief. He doesn't have the reflexes of a frog? Yes, of a frog, he said. You should really just consider him being an organ donor. That's the best thing you can do for your son. And the mother said, I completely disagree with you. I'm not making him an organ donor. Go back in there and do the best you can. I think it's, it's kind of a, you know, I don't, you can't make this stuff up. I have the tape. I could play it for you. It's, it, and it's true. So how do we explain this? How do we understand this? I think a lot of it is the confluences of all the social backdrop we just talked about. But I think it's also this. I don't think it's the malintent of the ER doc, who's, who's I don't think he's trying to be a bad guy. Uh, but I think that most of us who don't work in this area in brain injury see the loss of consciousness as the end game of a disease process. Most DNR orders, for example, are written by surrogates. When? When the patient loses capacity or loses conscious ability. And it's usually, you know, the gig is up. End stage uremia, end stage heart failure, end stage cancer. There's a loss of consciousness. So the doctors, drawing upon an analogy to their acute care experience, see this loss of consciousness as if it were the end of the game. When in fact, and would be the usual prompt for a DNR discussion, when in fact, in brain injury, the loss of consciousness could be the end of the game, but it also could be the beginning of recovery. Uh, and, 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 and it's also this notion that, that this state is not going to be transcended. It's not going to change. That this injury, as bad as it is now, it's not going to get better. But for brain injury, the first day is often the worst day. Uh, and, and then there can be progress. But this is not an old story, this notion of the static brain or the dynamic brain. It goes all the way back to a fight between Galen and Hippocrates. And this is the cathedral ceiling in the Montreal Neurologic Institute, designed by Wilder Penfield himself, who was a neurologist, neurosurgeon, and a legendary, he, he mapped the homunculus, a legendary epilepsy surgeon. And the Montreal Neurologic Institute was the model for the NINDS at, 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 uh, at the NIH. And what you see here are Golgi cells, early images of the brain in, in, in um, Egyptian hieroglyphics. And in Greek, you see around the circle there a statement by Galen in refutation of the Hippocratic aphorism that all brain injuries are invariably a, you know, fatal and a bad deal. And Galen says, but I have seen the injured brain healed. And this is this this tension between you know, what, how we look at brain injury uh, that I think we need to overcome, because the brain is really far more dynamic um, than, than we've ever imagined. Now, Dr. Plum, this is an earlier picture of Dr. Plum, just to show his intensity, because we're not sure what he's going to do with this, this hand. Um, but, but back in, his, uh, in the mid-'70s, I went through his archives. And, I mean, his archives from the mid-'70s went back through them a couple of years ago found this uh, statement about the importance of discerning the vegetative state as, as a kind of a futility situation was to, to, to risk stratify other patients who might actually do better. It wasn't all about futility. It was also about utility. And Fred wrote, you know, we've studied 100 patients, and within 24 hours, well, we can tell uh, by their neurologic signs alone who will not recover above a vegetative level, who will do well. And then the key point, this leaves a middle group for whom more information is needed, but where presenting every effort to treat must be made to know their maximal potential and how to judge their early signs. So he intuited that, that there were some patients who looked horrible at the beginning, but who might actually have a different trajectory, that there was going to be variance in outcome. Um, key variance, key point, one point, you want to remember one thing from this talk, Traumatic brain injury, people do better than anoxic brain injury. If you, that's all I leave you with, that's enough. Okay? But here's the case that was kind of the paradigm shift. Um, it actually says paradigm shift. Okay, it was Terry Wallace. How many of you have heard of Terry Wallace? So Terry Wallace was a young man who had been in a, in a car accident in 1984 uh, uh, when in 2003 
Uh, he had been, in a, he had been in, in a vegetative state and a coma had been described all sorts of ways, but the operative diagnosis was the vegetative state. And in July 2003, uh, while he was in custodial care, he woke up or started talking. He said, Mom, and then he said, Pepsi, and he developed greater fluency. In his world, Ronald Reagan was still president. He was locked in 1984. He was like in this eternal present. How do you like these, these religious, uh, you know? I, and I wrote a whole chapter on, the, on Augustine and, and uh, the eternal. He's locked in time. But imagine not knowing which version of yourself you are. You know who you are, but are you the 1984 version or some other version of yourself? Um, and, and the reality was, though, that, that this is Terry here, that, that if you go back, as I did, and look at his chart, uh, there were behaviors in the chart that suggested that he had been minimally conscious and not vegetative. But the minimally conscious state did not exist till 2002 in the literature. So he had, a, he had a brain state that didn't yet exist. So how could doctors diagnose him that way? So the family said, I thought he did this. I thought he did that. They told him, don't worry about it. Um, you know, he's vegetative. He's not going to get better. They'd asked to be seen by a neurologist for 19 years. It wasn't going to be covered. They wanted to scan. It wasn't paid for. I've interviewed Mrs. Wallace at great length. Turns out, actually, in other, other papers since then, that 30 to 40 percent of patients with a traumatic brain injury who were in nursing homes who were diagnosed as vegetative were probably not. That's a huge diagnostic error rate. Um, so, and, he, and he developed contractures even as his brain started to, to get better. Uh, at one point, I was trying to get him rehabilitation through his congressman, Marion Barry from Arkansas, not the Washington, D.C. mayor, from the 1st Congressional District, and I called up their house. And I was speaking to Mrs. Wallace. I said, what's his social security number for constituent services? And she told me. But I heard a voice in the background. And I said, Mrs. Wallace, was that Terry who told you the, the phone number, the um, social security number? And she said, yes. She said, first time he told us, we thought he was wrong. We looked it up. He was right. Um, and he's continuing to improve. He now knows the song, bad boys, bad boys, what you're going to do. Now, that may not be an improvement, actually, uh, but, but, but it's important because that song didn't exist when he got hurt. But the most chilling part of his story uh, was back in 1991 or two or something. It's in the book. I don't remember exactly when. And Mrs. Wallace gets a call from the nursing home. And they say, you've got to come in. Terry's just not right. Now, the nurses in this book are often intuiting and seeing things that the doctors have been trained not to see. But the nurses saw it. So Terry's not right. Now, they, they, they're not into the, into the rigid categories of what brain states are. And this is 10 or 12 years before the minimally conscious state is a real category. So she walks in, and Terry isn't right. He's like, kind of like, you know, his, he's kind of like bug eyes, and he looks scared, like frightened. But vegetative patients can't be frightened, right? It's not part of the, 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 the category. Well, what had happened? His roommate, he was in a nursing home with elder, an elderly man, and his roommate had asphyxiated himself in the sheets from his dementia, and he watched this man die. Now, I don't know what Terry felt or thought, and, and, and when he recovered more, he doesn't remember this, because the, the hippocampus and the memory areas in the brain are exquisitely sensitive to hypoxia and to trauma, so he doesn't remember that part of his life. But he experienced something, and, and it was only years later, in retrospect, that it became obvious that Terry had been minimally conscious uh, uh, throughout that period of time. So here's the amazing thing. A paper by Henning Voss, my colleague, Nick, Nicholas Schiff, who is my partner and neurologist partner. This is a paper that was in the Journal of, of uh, Clinical Investigation uh, just, uh, in, in 2006 using diff diffusion tensor imaging, which is a kind of fMRI study that looks at the, it's a kind of tractography looking at individual fibers. And I want you to focus on the red in the, in the screen here. And the red fibers are left to right lateral fibers. And you see here, just to give you a sense of how badly injured he is, this should be his corpus callosum. And it should go all the way back in red. But only the front part is, is intact. But what you see here in his, 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 his occipital lobe here, uh, and up here circled, uh, is are a set of fibers that normally we don't have in our brains. And then 18 months later, they've disappeared. And what you see down here is a new set of fibers in his cerebellum. And this was described as axonal sprouting, new connections between existing neurons after a long period of, of latency that may represent 
the rationale, though we can't prove it, uh, of why he began to change. But it shows a dynamic quality to a, to a severely injured brain. And what's fascinating to me is that never in the history of humankind, in the history of human biology, has someone who's had this much injury survived this long to the point where a long period of latency might stimulate a developmental process for a, a regenerative wound. And the axonal sprouting that you see here is the exact same sprouting that, that happens in the preemie brain, the child brain, the adolescent brain as it sprouts and it prunes back. It's the last part of our brain that we, we connect, as it were, is the frontal cortex, gives us the age of majority, maturity, executive function, and then it prunes back. This would not happen, you know, just if you got hit on the head, you know, willy-nilly, but there's something about the latency and, that, and the change. And yet, this was on the front page of the New York Times, okay? And yet, Terry Wallace is still not getting basic rehab. There's a letter from Mary and Barry back to Mrs. Wallace, you know, saying I'm going to do everything I can to get him a physical therapy. Another marker how this population has really been neglected and marginalized and, and put aside and makes them vulnerable to the organ retrieval issues that we've, just, that we, we've described to some extent. So let me, let me just kind of summarize to give you a kind of a, a framework of the, of the categories here uh, and we'll continue just to, to put this, the narrative into some kind of graphic. Brain injury, bad enough to lose consciousness, become brain dead, whole brain dead, or you can recover. <clears throat> you then go into a coma, and a coma is, is usually self-limited, uh, and you can recover from a coma really quickly, uh, and you'll probably pass you know, through these stages, but you can do it very quickly. Um, and you can have complete recovery from a coma. I could speak long enough and I could put you into an induced coma, and, and you'd recover. If the coma, after the coma lasts for a week or two, um, then there is recovery of the brain stem, uh, which is the isolated recovery of, of what leads to the vegetative state, the arousal mechanism, sleep-wake cycle, startle, autonomic function, etc. The vegetative state is described as becoming persistent after a month and described as becoming permanent here three to 12 months after uh, anoxic brain injury or 12 months after traumatic brain injury. The problem is the abbreviation for PVS is the same for PVS, so everybody's all over the place, and there's a lot of you know, confusion on that part. Now, here's, here's an important point between the three and 12 month distinction. Here are five vegetative brains that we wrote about uh, back in, um, in 2002. These are five patients who were vegetative, and, and, and what you see here is metabolic activity, blue being low, red being high, and, and first of all, it means that you can't make a diagnosis based on a picture, right? You need to know the context. But you see here that in an anoxic brain injury, there's a more kind of global pervasive insult. So these people declare themselves in three months as permanently vegetative, whereas the traumatic folks take up to a year. And then you look at this person, you say, like, this person shouldn't be vegetative, right? And this, there's too much healthy cortex. This kind of relates to what we were talking about here. What happened here? This person took out his thalamus, okay, through the herniation. And the thalamus is the integrative functioning uh, element of the brain. That, 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 that we, we, we communicate with the cortex from cortical thalamocortical tracts. And the thalamus is to the brain what Hartsfield Airport is to Delta Airlines. Okay, it's the hub. If, if, if there's snow in Atlanta, even if the planes are flying, you can't make your connection and you can't get there from here. Okay, and so that person who's in that first column has a lot of available cortex, and, and, and Lena, you know, we were talking about this, a lot of available cortex, but no integrative function. Okay, so that is why we have the three to 12 month distinction. Now, what typically happens, people are in the hospital after a traumatic brain injury, three to four weeks, they're still vegetative, they haven't improved to the point of, of being sent to rehab, and they're not making progress, so they're, they get sent to a nursing home. And they are, in fact, in the vegetative state. But then they have what I've described as a surreptitious recovery. And they're in the minimally conscious state, but they go unnoticed, because those behaviors are kind of episodic, intermittent, and nobody knows what they are still. And then the only time we realized that they were minimally conscious was when they emerge and start talking. In retrospect, you say, oh, well, he must have been minimally conscious all along. You look at the record, 
and there's evidence that he probably was. And that's, that's the sort of typical story. This is the criteria that were published in 2002, the Aspen criteria. This, these are actual Aspen trees um, there that I took um, at a, with my own camera for your viewing pleasure. Uh, and these are the criteria on the um, minimally conscious state. Now let's, let's do a comparison between MCS and vegetative state. And let's look at Terry Schiavo versus Terry Wallace, a tale of two Terrys. <laughs> oh, no, even I don't like that. Uh, so she had a noxic brain injury. She was permanently vegetative. She was evaluated by some 22 different courts, all of whom said she was uh, vegetative. She actually got deep brain stimulation in an early Medtronic trial. Uh, how they got consent for that, I don't really know. She was wakeful, unresponsive, reflexive, static state, and disintegrated. She did not have an integrative cortical function. Terry, on the other hand, traumatic, better prognosis, minimally conscious, merged in 2003, continues to improve, and he's reintegrated. But he had been vegetative, and he graduated into the minimally conscious state. And the perils of premature prognostication, we talked before about this relationship to DNR, is that 77% of anoxic comas result in death or PBS, 50% of TBI comas as well, but 50 will not die or be permanently vegetative. And Reese and Akasone recently had a paper that 22% of people who have traumatic comas are, are above the minimally conscious state after their recovery. So there's this role for what I've described in the, and this is the stupor of coma, the fourth edition, time delimited prognostication. And basically, it's not making a global statement when you're out here in the Atlantic about where the hurricane is going to land, but try to use milestones to understand where the patient is headed. So if somebody is in a, in a, in a, uh, in a coma and they, they recover consciousness, that's great. But it's better to be in a coma and quickly become vegetative than to linger in a coma because it means it's a quick recovery of the brain stem. So that would be a good prognostic sign. And I, and I would say to the family, let's see how the comatose state goes, and let's see how long it takes for them to get out of the comatose state. But however, if then they're vegetative for a month, and it's now persistent and it becomes permanent, that's also, that becomes a negative prognostic sign. So the thing is, you want to break the story up into little pieces, and so instead of making a kind of a global statement at the outset, unless, of course, you, you know, you're, you're in the verge of herniation, and they look more like they're brain dead. Uh, and they're on the extremes of, of catastrophe. So the idea here is, you know, error cone and time right here. It could be all the way from here to here. If you get closer, your, 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 your error is going to be negative, uh, smaller. So the point that I would say one of the key things is to exclude, you know, all MCS patients at a year from the bundle of people who have been called vegetative. So we don't have a category error that's, that's, that's enduring. But it gets even more complicated than that. And it gets back to this notion of disintegration and integration. And here are a couple of studies that were done that I think point this out. Stephen Lorries in Liège did a study of vegetative patients versus normal controls and demonstrated that if you inflict pain by compressing the nail bed, the vegetative patient does not have an integrated pain network. They light up the primary sensory area, but they do not integrate the network. Okay. That's in contrast to a study that was done at Cornell, and I'm sorry that all the names have gotten cut off at the bottom, uh, 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 Joy Hirsch, Nico Schiff, uh, other colleagues. Um, they took, this is a, a paper that happened right at the time that Terry Schiavo was, uh, was, was about to, February 8, 2005. And what, we, what was done was uh, they played um, family narratives, you know. Remember, lady, when we were kids, we went to the beach, and, and mom and dad, this and that, you know, something that would be emotive, you would read it to me. And then we play it forwards and backwards. So it was the same frequency spectrum. And what happened was the minimally conscious patients, when it was played forward, lit up their language networks, an integrated language network. When it was played backwards, they didn't. Graduate students were the normal controls. A lot of people have criticized that. <laughs> um, but the, the graduate students lit up in both directions and were almost hyperacute in the reverse uh, frame because they were trying to look for words and, and figure it out. But, but I was quoted here in the Times uh, that day, and I said, this study gave me goosebumps because it shows this possibility of this profound isolation. These people are there. They've been there all along, even though we've been treating them as if they're not. But this distinguishes, I think, the disintegrated 
the lack of a network response in the vegetative state versus the network response in the, in the uh, MCS patients. But it gets even more complicated. Upper left-hand corner, study Adrian Owen did, which was in Science in 2006, a patient who was clinically vegetative, all right? And they asked this patient to imagine herself walking through her house, imagine herself playing tennis, and disaggregating two linguistically similar words, language, motor, and spatial um, uh, networks were lit up just like a normal control. And, and the question is, what do you call these people? And we, we decided, we wrote a piece in the Hastings Center Report, non-behavioral MCS. Because these were people were responding, but by classical criteria, they were still ve vegetative. At 11 months, the same patient, if you put a mirror to their side of their face, would look at the mirror, satisfying the behavioral criteria for MCS, okay? But you have a discordance between behaviors on the outside and what's going on in the inside, uh, which should give us all pause. And then we have this paper, which is Martin Monty's paper uh, from the New England Journal of Medicine, I think it was in 2011, where he took that same, you know, playing tennis and spatial navigation imagery, and for one patient who, until that point, had been uh, diagnosed as vegetative, um, toggled those responses to yes and no. So this became a, a neuroprosthetic through imaging that allowed somebody who heretofore had been classified as vegetative to communicate. However, if you read the care paper, paper very, very carefully, after your like fifth or sixth reading, you realize that they went back and then they were able to find behavioral manifestations of this person being minimally conscious. But the point is, you know, they probably wouldn't have looked so diligently had they not known that this person was to do it. I should say that the best metric to identify these patients is not neuroimaging, but what's called the, the, the coma recovery scale, the CRS, revised, designed by Joe Giacino, who also was the lead author in the MCS uh, criteria. And 30 of the 31 MCS patients were identified by bedside uh, imaging, as it were, through a neuropsychological exam on multiple occasions. That's another important point. You've got to do this on multiple occasions because you're going to get a false negative because the behaviors are episodic. But for that one patient, the imaging here was, you know, was liberating. You know, it changed the game changer, and, and, and it made us realize this person was indeed not vegetative and could communicate. And then the question is, what do you do? You know, like, how do they communicate? You know, do, does he get a scanner in his bedroom? Or, I mean, how do, you, how do you do that? And then you think of the profound isolation. The good news is that it's, got, it's kind of like an expressive aphasia. He can hear you. You know he's there. You can talk to him. But it makes you, you know, uh, have a lot of pause. And it makes you have pause when you want to turn the vegetative state criteria into brain death so that you can do organ transplantation because you might have somebody who was actually conscious and alert and awake but no, no motor output. Now, um, that's the science, yet the reality is patients are discharged prematurely, there's length of stay pressures, this notion of medical necessity, um, which is a behavioral sort of manifestation of improvement. If you don't improve, don't manifest behavioral improvement, we're not going to pay for your care. It's a CMS regulation. But the brain could be recovering, the body's not recovering. And so people get discharged prematurely, and uh, no one is, is, is immune to this, even, even Bob, Bob Woodruff. Uh, here's here's you know, one, one woman of a patient, one mother of a patient, um, Dustin Manwiller, and I have the HIPAA coverage to say their names, uh, who is now communicating with us vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, a computer interface, okay, and, and was just at Cornell and Rockefeller, uh, was discharged prematurely from his hospital uh, with central hyperthermia, almost died, had a fever of 106, and his mother brought him to the nearest nursing home to where he, he could visit her. She could, she could visit him. Um, and then she makes this kind of really, like, heart-wrenching statement. She says, you know, it was too early to send him out, you know, to a facility where there wasn't any monitoring. And then she says, just kind of heart-wrenching way, there was no way to know he was in any kind of distress and actually saw him because he's not going to yell out or anything like that totally dependent upon the goodwill and the vigilance of others and their vulnerability. Bob Woodruff himself uh, wasn't making progress. They were going to send him out 
uh, to a nursing home, and, and Lee Woodruff said, damn the doctors and their predictions and caution. This is my husband somewhere inside that hurt and broken head. He knew me, he loved me too, but was scared and confused. Um, if you're going to have brain injury, you want Lee Woodruff to be your wife. Uh, um, and then a few days later, Bob Woodruff wakes up and says, hey, sweetie, where have you been? That's a question we have to ask for all of us. And here's, I think, the most heart-wrenching of stories. Um, someone we didn't get to see, Don Herbert, who was a fireman in Buffalo, had anoxic brain injury, it seemed. But in fact, he was a fireman, got hit on the head by a beam, and but was being hyperoxygenated because his fireman's mask was right in front of him. So he, wasn't, he was miscategorized. Initially, he's talking, and then and, 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 uh, he was injured on July, uh, December 29th, uh, 1995. And, and he stops talking in the spring of 1996. Um, and then in 2005, a, a physiatrist at the nursing home where he was at uh, started giving him some psychostimulants, and we really don't even know what it was. And he, and he starts talking, right? We realize it's true, we don't. He starts talking. And, and he had had four kids. He came from a clannish Roman Catholic family up in Buffalo, um, firemen. And he had four boys, and his little boy, Nicky, was his last little boy. And Nicky was about four or five years old when, when his dad got, got hurt in this fire. So Linda Blake, um, who is Don's uh, wife, gets a call from the nursing home. Again, the nurses are just spectacular uh, and say, you know, you've got to come here because Don is talking. And she's in her car. Imagine getting a car call. She's been calling around all the Mayo Medical Centers, all these fancy places for the last 10 years to get someone to care about her husband. Nobody wrote back. You know, um, so she she she's driving there. But first, she calls her son Nicholas, who's now 13. She said, "Call your dad on the phone." What do you mean, call my dad? My dad, my dad is you know, my dad doesn't he doesn't answer the phone. He's you know, he's in the nursing home. He's he's a vegetative patient. She said, "Dad's talking. Call him up. Let's let's keep this link. This thin threat. This is what happens." So Don Herbert is incredulous that now his teenage son, his little Nicky, is calling him. And he says, this isn't Nicholas. He's a baby. He can't talk. Nick responds to his dad, I can talk. Do you know how old I am? He tells him, I'm 13. And Don responds with a vernacular, holy. <laughs> and, and it's interesting because that during that whole day, his personality is intact. He, he recognized he has cortical blindness from the hypoxia that he did sustain um, from the visual cortex, but he recognizes the voices of his firemen friends. He remembers what's going on. Later, um, Linda asks her son how her, his father sounded, and Nikki reminds her, he says to his mom, I don't know. I can't remember ever hearing him speak before. And, and it's like Joyce's Ulysses for 16 hours. Everything is going, well, he remembers everything, but he also knows who he is. And he feels guilty. He feels a father's grief and guilt. And he feels like he's abandoned his family. I've been gone such a long time. We were hoping to get Don uh, Herbert down at Cornell to enroll him in our studies. But a few days after this happened, and he was on 60 Minutes and everything, he fell. He got pneumonia. He eventually died. Um, but he's not alone. There's, there's, there was Gary Doggerty, the coma cop in the 80s in Nashville, our own Terry Wallace. Don Herbert, and they're all, you know, suffering from this challenge that he was in he was in the minimally conscious state during that period. But the studies from Whammy have shown in the archives of physical medicine and rehabilitation that there's no correlation between how long you're in the MCS state and your likelihood of recovering. The longer you're vegetative, the less likely you are not to be vegetative, because it's a very simple system. But there's a multiplicity of connections in the minimally conscious brain. And, and yet, we, we can't predict. And that's what we're trying to figure out at, at Rockefeller and at Cornell. And this is the medical necessity argument that is predicated on the sense that we know how long you should be in the minimally conscious state. It's an efficiency argument. But we don't know what the denominator is. We don't know what the time course is, because we don't understand the biology. And I wrote this piece in the Archives of Neurology last year. And the punchline is, you know, brains were covered by biological standards, not reimbursement criteria. But that's how we pay for it. Um, let, me, let me just kind of quickly summarize one more, I think, important part of this, is that this is not all observational, but there, we're beginning to get some kind of therapeutic engagement. Um, again, with, no, you know, with all the dispensations for the therapeutic misconception here, I won't go into all that, but the idea is that we might be able to change 
the injured brain. And we were looking at all these people have these long latencies, they recover, you know, might we do something to improve their likelihood of recovery? Might there be untapped residual and integrative capacities? Could they be identified by imaging? Could they be accelerated? And there has been a, uh, uh, this is a paper that we wrote uh, with Kathy Foley and Nico and I uh, about, an MC, uh, about an IOM uh, meeting that they, we tried to get funded, which didn't get funded, but it was initial, an initial meeting. Um, pharmacologic interventions, the use of imantinine has shown to accelerate recovery in disorders of consciousness, a randomized clinical trial involving some 1,100 people in New England Journal of Medicine. In our own work uh, with, a, with a patient uh, in the minimally conscious state who got deep brain stimulation and stimulation of the intralaminar nucleus of the thalamus, again pointing to the centrality of the thalamus as this kind of integrative function. Simply uh, put, this is a man who had been assaulted in New Jersey um, and uh, was in a minimally conscious state. Uh, his initial coma, classical coma scale was three, which is as low as it can go without you being dead. Um, he transitioned to MCS about three months into it, um, and he was readmitted into our study four years after a very steady baseline. And uh, this, this study is a, is a lecture in and of itself in research methodology and the like, but let me just summarize that it was a six-month double-blind crossover study. Um, these are the stimulators here. They look like they're enormous, like you're driving a truck into his brain. But this is a CAT scan, and there's a lot of reflection off the electrode, so it's distortion. Um, he had increased cognitively mediated behaviors. It's a man who could only communicate, you know, with, with his eye or his finger. He couldn't say any words. He could, after stimulation, say six words at a time. He could answer questions. He could tell his mother he loved her. He could go shopping with her um, and, 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 and choose clothing. Um, uh, and uh, he could say the first 16 words of the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, he had improved limb control, and he could also masticate and eat for the first time without a peg tube. And in fact, when the stimulator was sometimes turned off and he was being fed, he would aspirate. You know, it, it just, it, you know he needed that to maintain his, his uh, level of arousal. Um, and it was first evidence that DBS could promote late recovery from severe TBI, and this is in Nature in 2007. For me, as an ethicist, uh, whatever that means, um, the most amazing moment was after we were done with the trial and we, uh, and, we, and we were doing stimulation parameters. They had these two electrodes. These electrodes are in these two boxes in their chest like a Parkinson's patient. And there are four electrodes, four, four prongs in each electrode. And you could change the frequencies and the size of the charge. And it's very laborious. And every time you change one thing, you've got you to start from the beginning and do it again. And it was a hot summer day. And somebody said to the patient, hey, so-and-so, uh, do you want to continue? And he said no. And, um, and, and, and they stopped. And originally when we wrote the consent document for, this, for the project, it was surrogate consent and all that. And I said, we have to put a, a codicil in that if the patient were ever to regain the ability to direct his or her own care, we would then consent the patient. This did not raise the level of consent or refusal, but it raised the level of assent and dissent. And for me, it was the restoration of some degree of moral agency, an agency ex machina through a neuroprosthetic device, which gave him the ability to be involved and, and to, to control his, his, his care. And ultimately, this is what it's all about for us. It's all about, and I'm going to stop here. I've got another you know, bunch of slides. But what it's really all about is to give patients a voice and, and to bring them back online um, so that they can, um, they can be part of a human community. Um, the, the Olmstead decision in the Americans with Disabilities Act back in 99, whatever it was, talked about maximally integrating these people into, maximally integrating patients with, dis, with, with disabilities into society. These patients have, have a two-tier problem. Their problem is that, that you know, we do, people who do disabilities work, they talk about, you know, they talk about not the disabled, but people with disabilities. They're still the disabled. So we have to, we, and part of this book's intent is to affirm their personhood so they're covered by laws in the ADA, which heretofore have seemed to be irrelevant to them because they've been treated you know, in a scandalous manner. But in fact, if we recognize their personhood, then we have to recognize that those protections they're, they are entitled to. And that, I think, is central to bringing them into community, community integrating them, giving them communication, which is clearly closely linked to, uh, to, to uh, community. This was known by Pedro Almodovar, the brilliant Spanish uh, Academy Award winning uh, filmmaker who in his film Abla Clonea um, 
you know, was mistranslated into Spanish, from Spanish into English. It's hable con ella, talk with her. And the English is talk to her. Big difference. The idea here is we talk with another, we talk to a plant. We talk to something that's vegetative. And, and I think he was affirming the notion of, of personhood here. Let me close, since this is all about organ donation, by saying that I hope this is, and I, I can, I can um, let me just go to that slide because um, you know, call for, for, for temperance. Just to be thoughtful and respectful for these people, not seeing them as instrumental means to someone else's end, but, but respecting their personhood. Uh, I think we should prohibit hovering. The families that I talk to talk about the organ donation people hovering around these, these beds of people who are, who are uh, a severe brain injury. We should prohibit premature harvesting. We should try to understand the types of coma that more likely lead um, to uh, dire outcomes and people who should be acceptable for a donation. Uh, we should do better jobs of prognostication for families and have that inform the informed consent process. Uh, we should also think about having a timeout uh, for, for donation um, amidst the shock and grief that a brain injury engenders so that we're not capturing a vulnerable uh, surrogate. Um, and it'd be great if we could delay it till after we got out of the comatose phase to see how people naturally declare themselves unless they're catastrophically injured and we know it's going to be going in the other direction. I, I think some of this would, would um, seem to delay uh, or undermine the, the donative uh, efforts, but I think having a little more transparency here uh, would be good for donative intent um, and it would be good for um, the beneficiaries of, of these organs to know that, it was, that, that these gifts were, re were, were received in an open and transparent uh, way. And, and for those of, you who do, those of us who aren't working in the, don the organ donation field, there's a lot of contentious feelings between the OPOs and the, and the docs. And I think by making this a little more transparent would be good. Also, I think we'd be more comfortable in heparinizing patients uh, if we were to heparinize patients, if we knew their prognosis was as grim as the, it really was, and we weren't inadvertently heparinizing somebody who might actually recover. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, 22% of people who have traumatic coma will recover above the level of MCS, according to Risa Nakasone Richardson's uh, uh, work. So that's a big number to, to make a mistake with. And, um, and I think that, uh, again, I, Mark is here, and I just want to again congratulate him, not in absentia, but in, in present uh, form, uh, for, for this 37th uh, you know, iteration of this conference and for having a, a contrarian view uh, in the mix. It's, it's sort of typical of your, of your, of your balanced view and, and, and why everybody has such great respect and admiration for what you've done here and, and, in, the, and in the field. So I'll stop here and I thank you all for your attention. I'll be glad to take your questions. Uh, yes, thanks. Um, I'm Michael Millis. I'm director of Transplant here. Hi. Sorry we didn't get a chance to meet um, before. Um, so if, let me just uh, kind of summarize what I think you said. Roughly about 22% of the patients that we currently use as DCDs could recover. No. 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 Okay. No. I, I'm, I'm saying I mean, donation after cardiac death is, is you know, they, they're dying for a reason. And, and I'm just saying that looking at this population as, as a category, you know, a severe brain injury, um, being pressured to withdraw care, you know, to mean, it would, would, it, it, these people have, may have prognostic possibilities. But not all DCD patients fall into this category. There are people who have other problems why they're okay. being DCD. So, so what, percentage, what percent of DCDs do you think could recover? I don't know. I think it's an empirical question. It, probably a question that no one's ever wanted to ask, you know. Uh, but, but, you know, I think, Dan, do you know? I don't have one. Well, well, I guess I want to question this because to be a DCD, you really have to be ventilated. And a lot of right. the MCS have full brain, right. have brain stem function where they're breathing on their own. So I would actually think the percent of people who are in MCS no, so we're not getting the MCS, but I'm, I'm so, so before they get to the MCS, they're in a coma state and they are, right, I mean, the question is, is and they are, and they are, they and they are, ventilator and they are ventilated, right. and if we take them off the ventilator, yeah, they're going to die, that's, right. we all know that, 
But the question that I have that maybe we don't know the answer is, is that if we were, so you got a pathway, you know, um, severe brain injury, not brain death, uh, coma, ventilated, one pathway is proceed down a DCD pathway. The other pathway is to say, no, we're going to wait for how they declare themselves. X period of time, right? whatever that period of time might be. Um, and how many of those, right? I, mean, I think we do know, we do know, you know, some broad issues, okay? We do know that traumatics do better than anoxics. Right. We also know that people who have hyp therapeutic hypothermia are better than the hypoxics. And so those, the, that, that's even you know, more unclear because it's a newer intervention. Right. So you know, my, my, my argument here is, is a simple one, that, 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 you know, that, that families, okay, when I talk to surrogates, they feel pressured, they feel put upon, um, that they feel badgered, um, uh, and, and staff sometimes feel, require, feel obliged to protect them from, from the, earnest, you know, the earnest efforts of OPOs. Right. The other issue, I think, is you know, there, there's, a, there's a conflict of interest you know, in how OPOs get paid and what they're incentivized to do. And I think that's another part of the story. But I think part of it is, is for, and I'm so glad I thought, gratified you're here, is that for people you, you, like you who do what you do, and thank God there are people like you who do what you do, hear a story like this so that you can, you can just add another facet to your reflective stance so that, so that you appreciate you know, the complexity of, of doing this and maybe the fact that it, maybe it's not the best time. You know, if you could wait a little bit, let the family adjust to the reality. Um, but, you know, you know, I wrote a piece of the Hastings Report back in 2005, and I, and I was a ch I chair an ethics committee, and it used to be a neurologist would say, there's no hope for meaningful recovery. We take that as the gospel as if it were true. And now I, I kind of want to know, how do you know that? And how do you, you know, because mm -hmm. we've seen people um, uh, um, recover, and it may not be a recovery that you or I would want, but the issue is it should be part of the informed consent process so that people have the information to make that choice, or surrogates have that information to make that choice themselves. Thank, thanks, Joe. I certainly um, you know, agree with you that we don't want to treat these pa patients as if they are brain dead, that we want to have uh, a setting in which they're not getting a lot of pressure um, and that they get good care if that's what the family wants or there's some reason to believe that's what the patient um, would, have uh, would, would, would have wanted, or at least what's uh, consistent with their values. But I guess part of what um, has always struck me as odd is how distinguishing the minimally conscious state um, actually makes us think differently, even in the early stage, about um, you know good good decisions to be made. Um, it seems to me, and maybe there are others in the in the room that. Um, um, I'd almost want to be um, in a permanent vegetative state than to be minimally conscious for 30 years, mm -hmm. able to um, partially appreciate the fact that there right. are, um, you know, that, that I and partially appreciate pain, partially appreciate right. the fact that I can't um, communicate with people on the hope that maybe, so, you know, so there are two <laughs> they're going to be brain, you know, they're right. going to be brain, there, there are uh, two you know, problems brain with, stem cells put into me yeah, and I'll recover right. 50 years from now. There are two problems yeah. with that. You know, Kiergaard said life is lived forward and it's understood backwards. And, if, and, if, and, and, and what you're saying right now is like right now, if you knew with certainty that you didn't want to be this way, you would have to not see a neurologist or a neurosurgeon in the ER. Because the that we, we've dichotomized outcomes. They're either miraculous or like on TV, or they're catastrophic. But the reality is people are on a biological continuum. So you have to, so there, these are, no one ever wished for this. You know? And one of the things that I was trying to write the book, when I was writing the book, which maybe you can't do in a talk, is like you don't want to be like proselytizing for the MCS state. Like, you know, we all want to be this way. That's not what I'm, you know, I really wanted to be very careful in saying, this is not a state that we, any of us want, but it may be a state that comes to us because of a form of fruit recovery. And so, so if, you're, if you're not willing to accept this, then, then you have to make different choices at the outset. It's also, it's also true for funding, because, because I think this is. That choice may be to be. It may be, right. But then, but then. Rather be a DCD donor, MCS, or a permanent vegetative state. But that should be a frank, open choice. The other, the other thing is, is, is the risk of projection, OK? So the patient who, and I'm, can I tell you like what I think is, for me, the best part of the book? 
Will I ruin it for you? I have ruin it for you. So, so go ahead, ruin it for him. It's just like you know, just like, it's like 800 people are not going to buy the book now. Um, so, so the patient. So I, you know, I. I, 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 you know, I wondered, like, are we creating, you know, by putting deep brain stimulation, are we creating a state worse than death? And, you know, and I wrote about this back in 2000, and, you know, you could turn the stimulator off, that's one thing. Um, and it's probably mostly reversible, although there is, some, there is some plasticity issues that we're learning about, which are healthy, okay? So the, 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 the person who got the deep brain stimulator, we, I won't mention his name here, but but um, you know I had I had in the book a section where somebody made the argument that that you know this is a fate worse than death and you know kind of what Dan just did, and I and I and I had you know I I, would I use that language, but that okay but you know I'm just doing a summary you know a, a summary you know like a kind of a, a shorthand, and 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 the mother of this patient tells me a story. She said you know one day, so and so was crying. And 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 she said to her son. She said, why are you crying? And, you know, and, and, and everybody, I was waiting for, you know, he's, he's now aware of how bad it is and it's a fate worse than death and he wished he'd met, he wished he had been a DCD donor, you know? And she, and she says, he says to me, he says, um, he, he was crying for Corey. And I said, who's Corey? And I've been talking to the mother now for hours and hours. She said, Corey's his brother who doesn't visit him. And then it's got, then there's like two levels of that. Is he crying because he misses Corey? Or is he crying because Corey is so upset he can't see his brother this way? So the, 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 the notion is that there's more there there than, than we might think. Um, and and, and he's, he was happy. Terry Wallace, again, when he recovered, turned, you know, I wrote this in a, in a piece in Cambridge Quarterly a few years ago, was at a family gathering, he turned to his mother spontaneously, said, Mama, life is good. You know, so you know, you know. I mean, it, it's 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 easy for us to think we don't want to be this way, and none of us would want it. No one wants to choose this, but we, you know, these are people. These are people who are already there, and if we had no more emergency rooms and we had no more trauma, the question still remains: What do we do with these people? And and that's part of that's been my focus. Uh, and and I think that the organ donation is kind of a you know it's a sidebar to a bigger story. But they wanted me to talk about organ transplantation, and it really bothers the families. Yeah, yes, sir. If uh, <clears throat> detailed study shows that if someone is following head injury, cardiac arrest, and a stroke, the pupils are dilated and fixed for three days, that person dies with a chance of 100 percent. Now, this is one side of the story. The other side, we know that if the person has severe head injury, and everyone who has severe head injury or severe condition that I mentioned, cardiac arrest, you put them on respirator, you are going to get occasionally condition that you so nicely reported here. Now, to try to find out what you are driving at or what your recommendation is, at what is stage clinically you are comfortable, no one is comfortable, but you are comfortable to stop the respirator and you say, I have done enough to know and now I feel comfortable to stop this respirator. Right, great question. And, and you know, this was a talk about diagnostic categories and I'm gonna turn it on its head now and say they only matter so much. And, and you know, we, we had a, a case where it turned out a woman had, had um, a hypoglycemic coma, which is intermediate prognostically between trauma and, and hypoxia. And the, and, the, and, the, and the sisters, in this case, of the patient were really, you know, what's her diagnosis? Is she going to be vegetative or is she going to be minimally conscious? How do you know? And, and, and we, went back, we went back to palliative care 101. And, and where we did, what we did then, we said, look, she says, what, what was your, tell me about your sister and what was her story. She had been, she had a substance abuse problem. She'd gotten her life together. She was going to school. She wanted to work in a bookstore or a library. She loved books. And then, then, then we said to the sister, you know, the sisters asked, do you think she'll ever be able to do that? I'm not sure what her brain state's going to be, you know? I mean, how minimally conscious, how much emergence. But she's never going to be able to, the, the goal of her, the life that she would have led was not attainable anymore. And at that point, the decision was made to withdraw care. So, is that the so the goals, the goals of care is really what I think ultimately determines this.
but but we have to be we we can't gloss over the possibilities that there could be goals in some of these brain states that before we had lumped together was just it's all really bad, you know, and we have to disaggregate that. You are facing that patient. There comes a time that you have to make that decision. In your opinion, when is that time? I think I think when when I feel that. Uh, we have fully, we have adequately and fully informed the surrogate decision maker of the information that they would need to make a, a good choice. And, and I, again, I'm, I'm more agnostic on the choice than I am on the importance of a good process. Because heretofore, it's been very prescriptive uh, and has not, been, has not been fully informed. And I think if you truly believe in informed consent, You've got to inform the surrogates and realize that in the short term, before we have better tools and drugs and prosthetics, we're going to give them more, more of a complex situation to make a choice in than for us to say, it's just terrible, let's just withdraw care. Because it's a kind of paternalism. When, when, when this whole thing came out about um, you know, the imaging studies, you know, Steve Miles on the MCW bioethics line, you know, trying to maintain the, the liberal you know, right to die agenda, which, you know, Dan and I were, you know, we're partisans together, you know, on Lou Dobbs <laughs> for several nights, you know, <laughs> hope letting Terry Schiavo die. You know, they, they thought we would disagree, but they were surprised when we didn't. <laughs> it was pretty funny, you know. Um, so, so it's really about, um, it's really about giving families the information they need to make an informed choice and refuse care. So, um, a scenario, two scenarios, actually. I'll go there with the first one. Uh, so, as a transplant surgeon, I get called by the OPO um, about a potential DCD donor. And I've learned everything that you said here, plus other stuff. And um, my sense is that this patient might have a reasonable chance of <clears throat> going into a minimally, uh, minimal state, right? Minimally conscious. Minimally conscious state. What do I do? Well, I always thought that the, DC, the DCD criteria were, um, were really about whether or not they would die within an hour after extubation. Right. right? So it has nothing to do with MCS. Well, but so... So this, physiologically... Yeah, so, so, so they are still in the, in, the, in the coma state, right? But I've learned enough from you and others that there's good prognostic indications right. so that to, he could get to the right. MCS. So, so what I would do, and, and, you know, and your ethics committee colleagues could go with, along with you and have a conversation with the family, and say, I'm know, just I'm just the don't I'm just the recipient, potential recipient, candidates surgeon. Okay. That they're well, calling me about a potential donor. And you're going to do the harvest. That they're going to go out. Well, let's say I'm just let's yeah. For the first scenario, I'm going to go out and do the harvest. I think I think that you have to be convinced as a moral agent in this in this sequence of transactions, uh, that 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 the, that the surrogates you know provided an adequate informed consent for for DCD. Uh, and and I, I think it's reasonable if if this was a state the patient wouldn't have wanted to be in and and you know had an advanced direction. What state is that? The, we don't know the state yet. Really. Well, no, you're saying the hypothetical was that the minimally conscious. Right. You, yeah. I make a comment. It's, it's sort of an irrelevant thing that you're saying. I think to the real case, because I don't mean that disrespectfully. I mean that what's happening is you want to trust as a transplant surgeon that the person that's prognosticating as the guiding physician is experienced and knows what they're talking about. They're using the neuroanatomy and not just shooting from the hip. And they're not making false claims. Now, how do you have confidence with that? You can't because you're the transplant surgeon. You really have nothing to do with the process. And what we heard today and very nicely is the science of prognostication is still evolving. But the art of prognostication still allows you to make wise choices. The art of prognostication is saying that even if that's part of the conversation. I can't think of a time where I have told someone that they're always going to be unconscious and never improve. Improvement is the rule for all survivors of brain injury. And the question is, what does that spectrum look like at the front end, even before it starts to narrow down? And if the best of all possibilities, when handled appropriately and ex with someone with experience, is well beyond the worst nightmare of that patient, such that they wouldn't want to survive, those are the patients who you're going to withdraw treatment on. Does it always happen correctly? No, that's the sad part. Does it happen by people who misguide people with wrong information? Yep, that's the problem. And, and I think time is, is really important here because it gets less complex as it evolves. Now, right. that, that may preclude you know, viability of organs and things like that, but I think the prognostic 
sensibility, the judgment needs to take precedence over the instrumentality of the organs. Um, but I think, you know, it's a lot harder to know at the beginning than a little further along. And there's certain milestones, as I mentioned, that might give the neurologists, the neurosurgeons, additional information to give you better information. Now, I do think, and maybe I, I agree with everything you said, but I might say that if you were uncomfortable with the the uh, the harvesting, say you were the agent for the other patient, and you didn't think it was was koshered, as it were, um, I, I think you have a right to be a conscientious objector and and, right. and and say or ask additional or say I need to talk to the family or I just need to get more information before I'm comfortable. Uh, about it, uh, even though it's not your primary task of consent, uh, it's important for you to feel comfortable. So, so Jeff, you, Jeff tries to repaint that very sharp line between the donor care team and the the transplant team, and and I appreciate that. On the other hand, we as transplant surgeons always have to confirm some things that some neurologist or some care team has done. And in this, in the case of brain dead, we make sure that there are two brain dead notes, and. So just as we do that, yes, we do. Just as we do that. It's not required. I'm not sure where we get two brain that don't require anyone as an assessment. But I'm with you. Well, so we, we have, we, it's part of our responsibility to ensure that that person is brain dead. Agreed. That's just, and so similarly, I would say that we have to be assured that the DCD scenario fulfill some criteria. What that criteria is, maybe it is the criteria that some team has decided that, that they're, and the family has decided that they don't want this, the patient in that state, and that's all we have to, to confirm. If that's the case, then it makes our job much easier. What I miscommunicated was, I did, the, the irrelevant part of my statement was that, that usually prognostication and withdrawal of treatment isn't based on saying someone's never going to wake up and be minimally conscious. That's not the conversation that should happen. I'm sure it does in some places. It's that, it's that even with awakening, the extent of disability and the time frames to get there are well beyond what the patient wanted, mm -hmm. if that's done correctly. And that's what I meant, is that the minimally conscious state, even if you know someone has capacity to get there, that should be part of the conversation with someone who's prognosticating appropriately. Right. But so should you police for that on your end? That's a, that's a very awkward thing because I bet you more than half the time, at least, it's not being done with lucid information. Right. So and by the time they arrive, it could already have happened and the family's gone and you know, there are logistical issues right. as well. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, I mean, I, can, I guess we have to figure out where the, the kind of the transplant surgeon's responsibility is for that proper information. Maybe it's zero. Maybe it's... We have to make sure that the information is properly presented to the family to get to that correct decision. I don't know where it is. I mean, this might be a case in, in, in these cases where, you know, the, the custody of the consent uh -huh. and, and the quality of the consent is important to be maintained. You know, it might be in, in certain cases when the ethics committee comes in and serves as a bridge between the clinical team, the caring team, the harvesting team, so that every, so the trust is there. Uh, and every and and you know you're able to to demonstrate that what should have happened occurred, um, you know. But again, I don't want to say that that you know these. The, the one point I do want to make is is that one of the things that's implicit in a DCD sort of story is a downward going prog you know trajectory, uh, and it's a degenerative process. Mm -hmm. People often analogize these people to Alzheimer's, you know, patients because they could be at the same functional status. But in fact, you know, these patients have an upward prognosis. As you rightly say, they're getting better. May not be getting good enough, but they're getting better. And DCD people are, are generally sicker and progressing, and they would have died. You know, and it, the decision was already made to withdraw care. You know, it's, it, there's a first decision to withdraw care, right. and then a secondary decision to okay. donate. So what, what, what I think is important, and I think sometimes that gets conflated with our population, where you know the issue is they should be a donor and therefore we should withdraw care versus you know let's withdraw care because the burden benefit ratio for the patient is not good based on his prior wishes or whatever the, the chronology is off and that can lead to distortions and coercion right so then the potential second scenario would be I'm a transplant surgeon I have reason to believe that the, the quality of the consent was not good but I'm provided an organ should I care yes why? I do, because I Why, think my I, responsibility is to my recipient, and no, I have, I think, a, I have no, an organ no, 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 in my in the bucket yeah. that I think your, is there or, usable. I think, I think your responsibility is, is to the system. It's like uh, it's right. like when you're defending a criminal, 
you know they're guilty, but they deserve their day in court because you're, def you're maintaining the justice system. And I think ultimately it's about the public trust. You know, um, if, if, you're, if you're maintaining the, you know, the integrity of the chain of the custody of the organ and its consent and all that, you know, you're making it more likely the next person is going to step up and sign an organ donor card. So I think your, you know, your your responsibilities transcend the individual case. But, and we all we are all I, public I, health officials, as I, it were. I, I, I agree with yeah. you. On the other hand, the next day my patient, my my candidate dies, it could have had that organ. Now I'm liable because I didn't transplant the patient. Right. Well, it's it's kind of you know we have we have we have different kinds of. I mean, perhaps that that's why perhaps we need to end. But that's probably. Perhaps why we need to get the ethics committee involved, <laughs> because they can fulfill some of those responsibilities for you, and you do have a primary fiduciary responsibility to your patient back home, but that doesn't negate your other responsibilities. But if they're in, if they're incompatible with each other, then your primary responsibility as a doctor or an individual patient trumps. But we have to make sure those other aspects of care are not lost in the in the. In I'm the pretty transfer. I'm pretty sure the family of the donor that I didn't didn't take is not going to sue me, whereas the the family of the patient who died is probably going to sue me. But for I did not I do want to say that I think it's important for the donors to feel that there is integrity in the oh, process. I, listen, and I and, I and I and I preface my comments yeah. that I agree with you. I, I'm, right. But I'm just telling you that there is certainly a group of transplant surgeons who don't agree with me, don't agree with you on that 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 there basis. There are a lot of people who don't agree with me. And <laughs> and would go go transplanting that organ regardless. So okay. uh, Lainey keeps telling me that we're out of time. <laughs> so thank you very thank much. You.